Hello and welcome back to Casual Physics. My name is Matt and in today's video, it's number two in a series on guesstimation, which is all about learning how to solve impossible problems like how many people are currently picking their nose in the world right now. We will actually come to that specific problem and answer it in just a few episodes time, but we're just ramping ourselves up at the moment. This is only video number two. Uh, so I'll just say, if this is your entry point to guesstimation, then please go back one video to the beginning. Watch this one. I just spent a few minutes setting the scene, giving you context as to why we are here. Today is all about you doing your first guesstimate. And this is going to be in the context of a fun planetary scale problem. More on that in a little while. But before we can get to that, I need to cover off two things. Firstly, what does success look like when we're guesstimating? Uh, and this is actually really easy to cover off. The, the goal of guesstimation is to get things right to within a factor of 10. So as long as our answers are not 10 times too big or 10 times too small, we'll consider guesstimation to be a success. That's the first thing. Second thing we need to cover off is like, how do we get there? How do we do that? And this is really the mechanics of how you actually guesstimate. And it's all about learning how to approximate things. So this is where we're going to spend a little bit of time before we head back and look at that fun problem. And so let's begin by thinking, how can we approximate something simple like my weight or my mass, which is technically 71 kilograms right now? We can say uncontroversially that that is approximately 70 kilograms. I don't think anyone would argue with that. But you can also say there is a sense in which we can say that my weight is approximately 100 kilograms. And that might sound a lot more surprising to most people because 100 doesn't seem to be remotely close to 71. So in what context does that kind of approximation make sense? Let's imagine you wanted to build a bridge, for example. You need to you know, have a ballpark figure for how much it's going to cost. Is it a million? Is it a billion? Who knows? Lots of complicating factors. There are people, there's cars, trucks, wind, rain, earthquakes. Who knows how many factors you need to consider? In that environment, considering all humans to be 100 kilograms is probably going to be good enough. It's probably a little bit too high. You know, most people don't weigh 100 kilograms, but probably we're going to estimate another number that's too low. So maybe the number of people on the bridge at any one time. And so, yes, overestimate on the, the weight of the people, underestimate on the total number, and those errors will tend to balance. That's the hope. And actually what is surprising is that kind of cancellation happens a lot more often than you might naively expect. And that's one of the great powers of guesstimation. It allows you to be really cavalier with the numbers and still end up with an answer that is ballpark figure good enough. But... It doesn't always work out, as you might have imagined. Sometimes we can be so cavalier, we're just downright irresponsible. And so, you know, we need to draw the line. You know, we need to find the balance between a cavalier and being irresponsible. And as you might imagine, there's no uh, complete, rigorous, precise answer for this. I can just give you a good rule of thumb. And it is that you need to get things right to within a factor of 10. So that 10 is coming up again. In this example, 10 times too small would be 10 kilograms. That's more like a fat cat, it's not a human. 10 times too big would be 1,000 kilograms. That's more like a car, again, not a human. In those situations, the, the numbers, the cancellation won't happen. We're not gonna get to a good answer for you know, the cost of building a bridge. There are other scenarios in which guesstimation doesn't quite work out. We'll cover them in, in a future video. For now though, I'd like to quickly summarize where we are so that we can get into that fun section. We talked about success. The goal of guesstimation is to get things right to within a factor of 10. That is our goal. We've talked about approximations. So how do we get to success? We need to pick all the numbers in our problem and make sure they are also correct to within a factor of 10. All right, why 10? Why not eight, seven, 13? There's no rigorous justification for this either. It's a kind of good rule of thumb, uh, but I can tell you my perspective on this, which is there are two reasons why 10 is kind of a big deal. Firstly, working with 10s just makes things easier. Secondly, there are some numbers that are just so big or so small that you can't physically write them down on a piece of paper without using a notation called powers of 10. And don't worry if that means nothing to you, we're gonna cover that in the, the next video. But for now, what's important is just that you see that 10 is kind of a big deal. 
And so that brings us to the kind of the end of our kind of intro section. We've set the scene, we've covered the essentials, and now it's time to have some fun. I promised you we'd have a go at a fun planetary scale problem, which is very simply to calculate the distance to the center of the Earth. It's the kind of thing the ancient Greeks used to play around with all the time. So we're kind of following in their lead and also building ourselves up slowly, building our confidence so that we can tackle more real world problems in future videos. So yes, this is our challenge. Can we calculate the distance to the center of the Earth using our general knowledge of life? That's the kind of idea. And so the, the life experience that we are going to be using to calculate this number is our experience of flying, flying around the world. And so the first question is what does flying around the world have to do with calculating the distance to the center? Well, the Earth is a sphere. When we cut it in half, we get this circle. And there is this wonderful relationship between the distance around a circle, called the circumference, and the distance to its center, which is what we call the radius. And don't worry if you've forgotten everything about circles, because we don't even need to consider the Earth to be a sphere at all. We can consider it to be a giant cube, and in which case that circle will become a lovely square, and then our lives will become an awful lot easier. It sounds bonkers, but this is the world of guesstimation. It doesn't really matter whether we use circles, squares, hexagons, choose whatever shape you like. The point is if we know something about going around, we can calculate the distance to the center, and that's the thing that we're really interested in. And so now we have to think about what do we know about flying? And when I say we, I mean me, I mean you. Take this opportunity, pause the video, and actually write down some numbers that pop into your head when you think about flying from one place to another or flying around the world. For me, I live in London, so when I think about flying around the world, I think Sydney, which I've never been to, but my friends tell me it's lovely, uh, and it's on literally the opposite side of the world. Now, again, I've never been there, but my friends tell me it takes about 24 hours to get there. So halfway around the world is 24 hours, full way around the world is 48 hours, and because this is the world of guesstimation, guess what we're going to do with that 48? We're going to make it a 50, make the maths easier, and 48 and 50 are definitely close enough, they are within a factor of 10, so we are all good to go. But that's the time. I want the distance around the, the world, so how do I get that? Well, if I know the speed, then I could calculate it. Let's refresh our memory about how that works. Speed is measured in kilometers per hour. Now those units tell you that there is a relationship between the speed, the distance, and the time. And it's that relationship that's gonna be really useful for us. So let's look at an example of driving down the motorway at 50 kilometers per hour. How far do we travel in any given hour? Well, let's take hour number one. How far do we move? Simply 50 kilometers. How about if we travel an extra hour? Double the time, we're doubling the distance. Triple the time, we triple the distance, and so on. And so you can see this kind of triangular pattern forming, and also this kind of straight line that we can draw, which are both visualizations of the relationship between the distance, the speed, and the time, which we can write as the distance equals the speed multiplied by the time. And so now we can see that if we have the time, which we've got, the time to fly around the Earth, and we know the speed of an aeroplane, which is this S, then we can calculate the distance, and that's what we're interested in. And so the question becomes, how fast does a plane actually fly? Do we know that number? And if we don't know it, how can we figure it out? Pause the video, have a think. Maybe you've been on an aeroplane and got bored, looked at the information screen, pull together the information that you know and come back. For me, I live in Europe, kind of, and I happen to know that Europe is about 3,000 kilometers across, and I've never been on a plane longer than four hours. So I've got two numbers. I've got a distance, I've got a time. I can now work out the speed with a bit of jiggery-pokery of that previous formula. Let's see how that works. So we take our formula, divide both sides by time. Time divided by time is one, so that kind of disappears. And we end up with this formula, speed is the distance divided by the time, which we can just stick the numbers in. So 3,000 kilometers, four hours, gives us 750 kilometers per hour. You won't be surprised to know that 750 becomes 1,000 because this is the world of guesstimation after all, and that becomes our guesstimate for the speed of an aeroplane. So that's my way of calculating the speed of an aeroplane. Not the only way, you may have a different way of doing it, and that's great too. Um, 
I have another way of calculating the speed of a plane because I know that the speed of sound in air is about 1200 kilometers an hour and planes don't fly that much slower than, than the speed of sound. So that would be another way that I could, I could get a handle on the speed of a plane. And the great thing about having several ways of doing things is that you can actually pull them together, combine them to get a more accurate estimate overall using a really cool technique called the geometric mean, which doesn't sound very cool, but it's very powerful and we're going to come back to it uh, in another video. For now, let's summarize where we're at. So for me, I've got the time to go around the world at 50 hours. The speed of the plane is 1000 kilometers an hour. And now I can just stick in those numbers to that formula that we talked about earlier on. Distance equals speed multiplied by the time. Speed is 1000, time is 50. And so we simply have 50,000 kilometers as our guesstimate for the full way distance to go all the way around the earth. And as we talked about at the beginning, if we know something about going around, we can calculate the distance to the center. And we have lots of different options to do that. We're gonna stick with the outrageous approximation that the earth is a giant cube, and in which case the cross section is a lovely square. So that's where we are. Uh, we have the circumference. We've spent a lot of time guesstimating this to be 50,000 kilometers. The question now is how does that relate to the distance to the center, which is the radius? That's the thing we're ultimately interested in. If this was indeed a circle, then it would be a bit more tricky. You'd have to remember the, the Greek pi and a bit of circular geometry, but because this is a square, we can just visually see the answer. Let's, let's see how that works. So we're going to count how many radii make up the circumference. One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, eight. So the circumference is eight times the radius, we want the radius, the distance to the center, so we can just divide both sides of the equation by eight. The eight divided by eight is going to disappear because it's one, and so we have radius is circumference divided by eight. Let's plug in the numbers. 50,000 divided by eight, that's what we've just calculated. You won't be surprised to know that that five is gonna become a four because 40 divided by eight is just easier to do. It's just five, and so our final answer is 5,000 kilometers. That's our guesstimate for the distance to the center of the Earth, which was the, the very thing we wanted to calculate at the very beginning. So that's what I got, but I'm really curious to know what did you get? How did you get on? Uh, there's a few different ways that you can share this information. So of course you can pop it in the comment section, that's great. But I've also created a little web app, which I put a link to in the description. If you go there, you can simply put in your answer anonymously and compare it to other people around the world, see the distribution of answers. I think that can be quite fun. So if you have a moment and you'd like to do it, pause the video, head over there, Come on back and let's see how, uh, how you did, how did I do compared to the actual measured value for the distance to the center of the earth, which is 6,371 kilometers. And how does it compare? For me, it's 1.3 times bigger than my estimate. I think that's pretty good considering, remember, the goal of guesstimation is to get things right to within a factor of 10, and we got 1.3. I think that's pretty amazing. Is it accurate? No. Does it need to be? No. Not if we want to, for example, you know, get an appreciation for our place on planet Earth. You see, the oceans are at most 10 kilometers deep. The mountains are at most 10 kilometers high. You know, there's some numbers for your mental wiki there. And so the, the kind of the rock that we live on is at most a few tens of kilometers thick. And it can't be much more than that, really, because lava, right? It wouldn't get through otherwise. So we live on a rock that is about 10 kilometers thick, roughly, approximately, right, within a factor of 10, that's true. And we've just guesstimated that the, the distance to the center of the Earth is 5,000 kilometers. And so we can now quantify the, the, the fraction of the Earth that we actually live on, which is just 10 five thousandths, otherwise known as one five hundredth and even better known as 0.2%, which is a teeny tiny fraction of the Earth that we actually live on. And so when we use guesstimation to do this, to get a sense of our place kind of on planet Earth, we can now see why it is that teachers at school say we live on the Earth's crust, right? A thin, hard shell 
on a planet that is nourishing and as heartwarming as indeed a freshly baked loaf of bread. So that is the essence of guesstimation. Doesn't have to be accurate, but it gives us a sense of something that's meaningful to us. So well done for getting through to the end and thank you for getting through to the end as well. I hope you enjoyed that process of coming up with your own guesstimate for this problem and I hope you're excited for more because there's so much more that we have to, to talk about. Uh, in the next video I'm going to be looking at a problem which requires very big numbers and very small numbers and the, the idea there is to kind of refresh our memories about how we work with those numbers in a quick and easy way because again guesstimation is about getting to those approximate answers in a quick and easy way. So that's what we're going to focus on next time and the final thing I want to say is if you did this problem in a completely different way to me, that's amazing. I'd love to hear about it. Um, please pop it in the comment section so that I can learn from you just as you learn from me and we all learn from each other. I'd really appreciate that. So yeah, thank you for your time and attention as always and I look forward to seeing you very soon.